Our speaker is Patricia Hayes. She is the principal and owner of PBH Consulting Group, LLC. She, that is a strategy consulting, public affairs, and leadership development firm where she supports executive level leaders. She is a licensed attorney. She has served as a respected policy confidant, advisor, and strategist to executive leadership at the state and national level in governmental, private, and nonprofit organizations for over 25 years. She has served on numerous boards, task forces, and committees at all levels, including her current community engagements, serving as board chair of the Greater Austin Black Chamber of Commerce, chair of the Community Advancement Network Board, and as a Texas Book Festival community ambassador. Ooh. Graduated from George McConnell School of Law at Pepperdine University in Malibu. Earned a Bachelor of Arts in Government from the University of Texas at Austin. She is married with two children. You can learn more about Patricia and her offerings on her website. And she's going to be talking to you about networking. Patricia. Fantastic. I'll get a sign from someone if I'm not. Hello, good morning, you all. Morning. I want y'all to know how special y'all are because I'm operating with you with only one and a half cups of coffee. <laughs> so, just know, I'm gonna make it though. It's all gonna be great. Um, I am not gonna waste a lot of time because this presentation normally takes a good bit of time. It takes more time than I normally have. So I want to be able to get through it, but I do want you to uh, make sure and know that um, I'm always open and available for questions, um, emails, and LinkedIn, um, because sometimes I forget to say that at the end. So um, when you connect with me on LinkedIn, because I do screen my LinkedIn quotes, um, I've had to start doing that. So make sure you tell me where you met me, okay? If you say, hey, it was great seeing you at the launch pad thing, you're in, okay? I won't ask any questions. Otherwise, I have to be forced me to have to go through your profile and try to figure out where we met. And then I'm like, is he trying to sell me something? You know, and I don't have to do that. So uh, I, I'm honored to be here. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Kathy, for the opportunity to be here. And I'm going to move around just a little bit. I've already been warned about the, the projector here. Um, so you heard a little bit about me. Um, I'm a lawyer by training. I've heard all the lawyer jokes, so, you know, I might laugh with you. Um, and, uh, but one of my things is that I have a passion for um, education, policy, and legislative. So I literally popped in and out of the legislative process for uh, uh, now almost 30 years and uh, have done a host of things along the way. About 10 years ago, I transition, transitioned myself and um, that's where I started my consulting business. It was not something I was seeking to do at the time. That's a whole other story. Take me to, we can go sit down and have a glass of wine and talk about that. And, um, but it has been quite, you know, an interesting process. And one of the things that I've learned throughout this is the fact that there are lots of relationships that you build up through the course of the years that we often take for granted. And um, I am not a big you know, fan of networking in the traditional sense. You'll hear a little bit more about that. But what I have learned is about the value of developing relationships, utilizing the relationships you have, and learning how to create new ones that are of value and help you. So that's what we're going to try to get through here um, uh, in a short amount of time, and also to make sure to, uh, to uh, leave you some time for questions. And when I say a short amount of time, it's not because an hour is a short amount of time, it's just that this presentation is like a four hour workshop that I do. So um, uh, that's why I say that. And I, I forgot to tell Kathy, because someone can earn a free spot at my next four hour workshop in July 22nd. So if you do drawings, then we need to like, do that. Okay, do that. Okay? <laughs> All right, so I have a couple of reflection questions that I need for you to ask yourself. Um, as we start and as we're thinking about this. And did everyone get the handout? Hopefully, I hope I made enough copies. Awesome. Um, the question is, first question, what is your most pressing issue or concern regarding networking and building professional relationships? Now, sometimes it's obvious, sometimes some not. But think about what it is for you. And the second question is, how badly do you want to get over it? <laughs> Ah, that's a whole second thing, right? Right? Anybody brave enough to uh, to share their answers to their questions? Ask the person again. 
The first question, what is your most pressing issue or concern about networking? I don't have one. I want to talk to you, you're special. <laughs> it's the, I, it's the nerve, it's the nerves of meeting, going, it's, up, it's about the old colleagues and the, perhaps the ones I haven't met yet, it's the nervous. Yes, ma'am. For me, I think it's my fear of the insincerity of the process. Yes. You know, a lot of times that likes an authentic relationship, and I always feel like if I network with someone, they're like, "What do you need from me?" And I'm about like, "What do you need from me?" And I'd rather just be like, "All right, let's be friends." And yeah, I'm because I'm a talker. I mean, I know probably some of y'all know that, but. Uh, I don't want to go up and talk to a wall, a stranger, an octopus, it doesn't matter. But I, I have a problem, though, with what I would view as being an insincere relationship. You're going to love this, then. So, because I want something. Right. Next. For, for me, I, I, I think for a lot of people, it's the matter of the time it takes to develop those relationships and to be authentic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, those are perfect. Now. The next part of the, the second part of the question is how badly do you want to get over those issues? Right? Because most of the time that's the thing we have the difficulty. It's like we may know, like I hate sit, sitting through happy hours, I don't like talking to a bunch of room full of strangers, whatever, I don't have time, it's a waste of my time. But how badly do you want to go get over it and how does it play into where the, whatever your situation is today? All right? And that's where I want you to think about in the back of your mind as we go through. Um, go through today. So first thing, networking is not a four-letter word. Uh, that's the first thing people have to get out. This is not about speed dating events. I hate those as well. I mean, they serve their purpose for some people, but they're not my favorite. Um, this is not about your know, first Friday happy hours and things like that. Though, you know, those are they all have their pace, place, but that's not what necessarily what we're talking about here today. Um, it's not talking about making nice with perfect strangers and you know, save a tree, save those business cards. I have a whole other philosophy about business cards that hopefully I'll make sure and get to share with you and talk to you about that. But the goal is not necessarily to pass out as many business cards as possible. I know that is completely against conventional wisdom, but I will explain to you why. You can't pass out a bunch of real business cards and not develop, and develop relationships at the same time. Does that make sense? So, this is about net giving. So what does that mean, right? When you move from net giving, you know, from networking to net giving, this addresses this um, woman's uh, situation here where she talked about it's not about just going to someone and asking them for, you know, say, hey, I need this. You need to flip the mindset and this is about what can you offer to someone. Everyone in this room has something to offer to someone. You have to identify what that is, but that requires you to take a little bit of time to have a conversation or review your situation so that you can know what to give. That flips the script completely on your opportunities when you're going out to network, because it's not just about, well, can I get that number? It's like, no, well, let's have a conversation. What, you know, what is it that you might need? It changes the dynamic completely when you're having that type of approach and conversation. I love this. Um, a quote from Tommy Spalding, net giving is all about entering relationships with a servant mentality versus a to-be-served mentality. Okay? So, it's a unique mindset. You have to focus on giving instead of getting. And you want to focus on authentic connections that will break you out of the networking box. I really try to resist using the word networking, but I'm forced to use the word networking because that's the term that's you know accepted out in society, but I will normally follow it up with about well, how, you know, what kind of relationships have you built today? Because that's really what it's about. All right. So when you're talking about building relationships, you want to make sure that you are open to it. Um, you have to have a strategy. That's another thing that most people you know lack. They just go out and you're just going into this and you're like, oh, I'm just gonna, you have to have a strategy. And you're like, oh, that's one more thing to create. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, it is. 
Because what it actually does, particularly if you're a person who is an introvert, if you're a person who just hates large crowds or whatever, the only way you're gonna make it through those situations is to have a plan. Have a plan walking in of how you're going to approach situations. Um, you know, if it's haphazard, it's not gonna work. You're gonna feel frustrated, you're gonna be like, it's time for me to go. And I'm speaking from personal experience. I'm like, y'all, I was a lobbyist for 20 years. Like, my job is to network and glad hand with people. Ugh. So, <laughs> I mean, you know, so let me give you a little example. I may be ahead of myself, but it's appropriate to tell this story here. One of the things that I had to do as a brand new lawyer, straight out of law school, I worked for a teacher's association. They hired me before I passed the bar. They had a lot of faith in me, thank God. And um, luckily though, I did pass the bar on the first try, woohoo! And so, but they had hired me because I had these legislative relationships I built up as a law student. And so they were like, if you pass the bar, it's two for one for us, so good. So I walked in, but as the baby lawyer slash lobbyist, I got the numb, the brain numbing job of having to show up at fundraisers at 5.30 you know, on random days of the week so that I could hand the check to the politician. Yeah. Could not stand it. I mean, I felt so slimy. I hated that. But that was a part of the job. But you want to talk about how to get through it? Here's how I got through it. Because I always got something else going on, right? There's all, this brain does not shut off. So I'm like, how can I make the best of this? So what I would do is, okay, my employer needs me to make an appearance and hand off this check. I will do that. Now, what do I need to do? <laughs> I'm drafting legislation about X topic. I wonder if so-and-so is going to be there. Put that on my list of things to look for. I'm planning a trip somewhere next. I thought I heard, you know, Amy say that she, you know, that they've been to Europe. Hmm, make a note to look for Amy at this event. All right. I went through this list, whether they were personal or professional, I had a plan so that I performed my duty. So good to see you, Representative. We hope that you will, you know, um, we look forward to working with you during the next session. Get that check out of my hand. Okay, now it's time for Patricia work. <laughs> right? That's what I would do. And that's how you have to approach it. Because that's probably the biggest situation that I've ever you know, talked about where it's most common where I really hate it doing it. My other thing is, you know, late night situations, especially now I have kids, they're teenagers, but when they were little, I'm like, oh my God, going to another dinner or something like that late at night. What, what, what do you need to do to make it worth your while? When you view it from that, and what it is you're accomplishing, then you're not just going to another dinner, you're not just going to another happy hour, you're going with a purpose. So I always have a list of two or three people that I need to talk to, and when I go to that, that's what I'm doing, I'm looking for those folks. The bonus is all the other people that I get to see or meet in that, in that room that night. All right, so that's real key to thinking about how to reframe this. Another great quote, y'all will figure it out I like quotes. Um, if you can't build relationships, you are being torn down. Building relationships takes time that people often aren't willing to devote, partly because time is a limited resource for us all. That says so much. People will quickly say, I don't have time to do that. If you don't have time to do that, you don't have time to move yourself forward. You have to be willing to take the time to make the relationships work. And guess what? you would be like the low, uh, there's a low percentage of people who actually do that, who actually follow through with that mindset, okay? So you're already ahead of the game by even having that in your, you know, in your brain of, hey, you know what, I have to make time for this because this is important. This is very important. Um, so, reminder, we all have the same 24 hours in a day. The question is how you use that. I'm not going to go into that. That's at somebody else's lecture. All right. <laughs> pathways to success. So everyone's pathway is different, right? And by success, I'm not saying, oh, making X amount of dollars, a job, you know, whatever it is. Your success is whatever it is you want. Everyone in this room is at different points in their careers, in their lives, whatever. Some folks have been working for 20, 30 years and like, I'm ready to get off of that, you know, 
treadmill. So other folks are like mid-career um, or they're, they're saying, hey, I'm ready to transition to something else. So whatever your pathway is, it all looks different for everyone. That's what makes it so fantastic and great because you're, it's unique to you, utilize what you have. Don't expect it to look like someone else's. That's one of the things that's real key because people say, oh, you have to do X, Y, and Z. I try to make sure I don't say that, right? Because yes, there are some parameters when you're working and when you're doing things about what it is, how you approach it, if there's a requirement. But when it comes down to it, you have to do what's best for you because your unique relationships, your, your <coughs> unique connections, you know, those are the things that you have and experiences. And you have to utilize them and be comfortable with utilizing them. So, here was my thought about what my pathway is going to be. <laughs> I was going to graduate from law school, yep. and I was to live happily ever after. <laughs> Ta-da! I was going to get married. I was going to have 2.2 kids. I was going to have a great dog, all of that. Okay, well, I did get married. We are still married. God bless us, 19 years. Um, yeah, God help them. Um, um, I have two kids who are just as smart and sassy as I am, and um, we don't have a dog because everybody's highly allergic to everything. So, this <laughs> is what my path actually looks like, right? And what I want to point out here is this piece right here, the undergraduate internship. Why would I put that? You know, that happened before I graduated. Here's why. My uh, last day, let's see, as I, I went to, to law school in California. And so I love California. I have some great friends there. My law school roommate is there. But you know, at the time that I was getting ready, I realized the cost of living was outrageous. The bar passage rate was pathetic, and um, and I kind of had had enough of the mo earth moving beneath my feet. Thing. <laughs> um, I mean, I went my freshman, my first year of law school was the Rodney King trials. Oh, oh. So yeah, smoke coming in up the coast, and it's because the city is on fire. That that's enough to kind of like change your mindset about something. So I knew that I was not going to stay in California. So how was I going to get back? My goal was either come back to Texas or get to DC. Those were my goals. Well, I just started using the contacts I had, which started with my mentor who I had worked with as an undergrad who worked for the governor at the time as the Senate liaison. Well, I had worked for free for her for my last semester of law school. I called her, all pathetic, y'all. It was so pathetic. <laughs> Everyone, hi. Hey, what are you doing? I'm finishing up finals. Do you have a job? No, ma'am. Call me back tomorrow. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Call her back Friday. She's like, when are you flying in? I'm like, I'll be in Monday. OK, when you get into town, you need to go see X person. OK. I go see X person. Suddenly, I have a job. Yay! Have a job. All right. So that situation led to my having a job every summer after that here in Texas. And by the time I got to my last semester, I recognized the fact that, again, I was not staying. So how can I do this? So, you know, they have a great externship program, which means you get to pay all of those thousands of dollars of tuition and you get to have an experience that you create somewhere else. So I created an externship here in Texas working for this, the speaker's office. Call Yvonne one more time. She made the connection with me with the director of research. I still had the interview, did all of that. They accepted me, perfect. That externship is where I worked for a full semester, my last semester of law school, here in Texas, in the, leg in the legislature, where they, were, they just happened to be rewriting the education laws. That's the field I said I was going to go in, right? They were rewriting the education laws, and I was right in the middle of it all. 
And that experience is what led me to my first job and everything after that. That. And how I even got to Yvonne is even more fascinating because as an undergrad, I was sitting in my anthropology class and my teacher was like, Miss Hayes, I need to see you after class. I'm like, what did I do? And he comes and he's like, hey, so I have this friend that works over at the Capitol, she works for the governor, and I'm looking at him like, uh-huh. He goes, but if you're not interested, I'm like, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because this man remembered I was a government major, he knew I was performing well in his classes, and he had a friend who said, I'm looking for some high-functioning, great people who I can start leading through this process. So here we are 30 years later, I still am in contact with my mentor, with Yvonne. She calls me sometimes, she's like, I don't know what you're calling me for stuff, I need stuff from you now, <laughs> can you give me a couple of connections? But that is how that started. And each job shifted. And I, you know, I have my little sunshinies and the jobs that I love and then the lightning bolts that requires drinks. Um, <laughs> and so, but that's just the point of showing that, you know, it may not be A to Z in a straight line, but there are some awesome things, but they all lead back to someone or something. We all have that. If you sit down and think about it, you have that. And the point is not to forget each, people, each of the people or positions along that, it's to remember them. Because when I got to this last point where I was transitioning, and I really was like, I don't know what I'm gonna do, how am I gonna do it? I mean, I work as a lobbyist in the legislature. Our job is to be nosy and to know everything about other people. So I could not quite be so open about the fact that I'm trying to get out of this gig, right? So how do I do that? I sat down and I said, hmm, two or three circles out, who are the people along the way who have always been supportive of the things that I've done and were always like, call me if you need something? That's what I did. I made that list of three to five people. I called them, I sat down. I got fussed at, one old boss was like, I can't believe you waited so late to call me. You should have called me sooner. Oh, sorry, I was a little, you know, worked up. Another one was like, oh, absolutely. And another was like, I don't even know why you're bothering thinking about that stuff. You know you could do X, Y, Z. Do you know what you're worth on the market? Well, I was pretty dejected at that point in time because I was dealing with some hell on my job. So to hear this from folks and to know that perception was like, oh, help me get outside of myself, and to remember, I'm like, there's stuff you can do. But that came from people I knew and because I sat down to recognize who was it that I could trust at that point in time. Wouldn't, it wouldn't make it on the, you know, the 10 o'clock news. <laughs> and that I could, who would give me some honest input. And so those are the things that you can do to help move things along and that's about Building, I wouldn't have been able to do that, though, if I had not maintained those relationships over the years. So, four quick strategies we're going to go through um, here today. And the first one is you have to know how to reflect. And we talked a little bit about that. And, um, but it's, it's the thing that most of the time people don't do because we're always rushing, right? I gotta go through this, I gotta go over these errands, what am I gonna do, I need to go get this application in, whatever it is. Okay, but you have to take the time to reflect on your situation, not just the oh, oh my gosh things, but the where am I and what can I gain from this and how can I use it to move me forward, okay? And so that's really, really key. When you're reflecting, I like to say it to do this in, in these, um, these ways. You have to be able to identify your business needs and personal weaknesses. You gotta be honest with yourself. And this is all relevant. You're like, what does that have to do with building authentic relationships? I'm gonna get there, I'm gonna get there. Okay, but you have to know what your needs are professionally and personally. Because when you're connecting with people, it's not always just on you know, a business point. You know how many times I've developed relationships or I've made contacts with people because, you know, I have kids. 
sitting on that stinking football field watching those kids run around. And then it turns out the guy sitting next to me is the director of the organization I've been trying to get into for two years. Right? That's when I say you got to look broader than just here and think about people and your relationships in a different way. Um, identify them and prioritize them. You're not going to be able to address everything all at once. But once you make that list, you have it. It's that whole thing of once you put it up, it's like, <sighs> right? So you want to be able to do that and to prioritize what's your, you know, what's the key thing that you want to be able to do. Um, use this information as the foundation for seeking out potential relationships from which to learn. So you're not starting from scratch. You're not starting from scratch. You're not starting from something you don't know. You're starting from what you know and what you prioritize. And when you do that, you'd be, again, you'd be amazed at what you end up discovering. The reflection number two is talking about your business and personal strengths. Because this is the source from which you will be able to give to others. Throw modesty out the window. It is okay to be able to say, I am damn good at this. And it takes a while for some of us to do that. I will say that. I mean, I've had that. Finally, I took it, I'm like, you know, my genius is in being able to identify a situation and tell you five miles out where that's going to end up and how it's going to go. And people are like, what? I'm like, sorry, it's just the way my brain works. But it's true. But I might have before would have been like, oh, well, you know, I'm kind of good at a little bit of strategy. No, I am damn good at strategy. Tell me your situation. Give me five minutes to work through it. And then I can probably process a few things. And how, I, how did I come to realize this? I was the person in meet strategy meetings who was sitting on their hands about to scream because while everyone else was taking four hours to get to something, I had already figured it out in 30, and had been rejected, like, oh, Trisha, that will never work. Okay, sit back, four hours later, you know, this is a great thing, and I'm like, I'm pretty <coughs> sure I said that three and a half hours ago. Very frustrating for me, but what I learned was to be able to move forward and to wait for everyone else to catch up, right? But also recognizing I am not the person who requires eight hours to get something done. Okay? So that's where you learn your, your strengths and your weaknesses and be willing to share them. You have to be willing to sell yourself. If you can't say something nice about yourself, who is? I mean, it's true. You have to be able to do it. So you have to be confident. All right. Um, so the number one, let me make sure I'm not. Part of my paper, my electronic pieces. I had a little, what is it? A little, uh, a little technical difficulty. Okay, good. Um, so there's a great book that I read, and it was a fascinating. That people were like asking me, you know, what's the number one character trait um, that uh, folks would um, expect in the workplace, right? And you get all these different answers, and the answer was authenticity. Blew me away. Totally unexpected. Because that's about being able to work honestly, develop some trust with someone, and know that you don't have to agree on everything, but you would be willing to be able to, you know, come to an agreement, work together honestly, and to be able to move forward. Not, you know, not all that, you know, backbiting, stabbing people in the back, all of that kind of stuff. All right. So on that lovely planning sheet that I uh, have in your hand, there's part one that's reflecting on you. We're not going to go through, but this is where I want you to be able to take a moment and to actually write out, when you get a chance, those things. So you'll see part one is identifying what those strengths and weaknesses are from, your, from a professional, from business perspective, as well as a personal perspective. All right? Again, if you don't write it down, you don't know. Or let me take that back. You know, but you're not being honest with yourself. And most of the time, we don't, um, what we don't write down, we don't act on. So that's the, that's the value in actually writing it out. Um, I did um, 
the, uh, a private version of this workshop um, last summer. And I was waiting to hear back because there was a couple of people that the manager said, hey, I want you to work one-on-one -on, -one on them. So they're going to do extra. And so I'm like, okay, great. You know, do these things and send it back to me. And this one person was like, just kept hedging. And finally I had to call her because I was like, this is not working via email or whatever. So I'm like, what? What's up? And she had to admit, she was like, I'm afraid to write this down because that's going to make it very real. And so I had to talk her through the value in doing that and how that will be freeing and helping her move forward to be able to do what she needs to do next. Okay? The second strategy, you have to review where you are. You have to take a deep dive into knowing who you are, who you, you know, who you know, um, and what you don't know. Because that's another thing, that may be a weakness, right? And not recognizing who it is, you, what it is uh, that you don't have in your, in, your, um, in your repertoire. But that's okay, because that's the thing that you're going to use when you go out to talk to someone. When you're sitting there at that happy hour and you're asking, hey, what do you do, what do you do? And they're like, oh, hey, I do this. You're like, oh, really? That's, you know, I've been wanting to learn more about that. But you have to be willing to be able to offer that up. You can't wait until you need relationships to develop them. Because that's what I see a lot of. This, Judy Robinette, she's the author of this awesome book, How to Be a Power Connector. That is a fantastic book. I read the book and I told her, I'm like, she stole all my content. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a fantastic book. But anyway, it's so true. It's so true. And, it's, and it, what's really great about it is that whole point of you don't have to know a thousand people. You have, you have what you need within the circle that you have because that's how you talk about leveraging the relationships that you have. Happy hour, our favorite thing. Um, this is the piece where most people get stuck up because they, they think that it's gotta be you know, oh, I'm gonna go do, I personally, I hate happy hour. I'm not a big drinker. I talk a lot of noise, but I am not a big drinker. Um, I'm like the fruity, slushy girl, you know. Um, so, <laughs> so I'm like, I, I get no thrill out of that. But I'm like, I know, down through the years, remember, I said I was a lobbyist, and I'm a lawyer. Oh my God, that's double full of people who drink a lot, right? And so, um, so I had to work through that. That's when that strategy comes in. I set out, you know, there are different tech, uh, tips and strategies that I talk about in the longer workshop, but one of the key things is one of two things. Set a time limit for yourself. I'm gonna go show up to this for 30 minutes. And or find a, find a buddy. Hey, you wanna go run with me to this? And, and that makes it way easier to tolerate. Um, I, have, I have a good friend of mine, well that was one of her things is we had this unspoken rule because you know, she always has a black dress and some heels and I'm like, hey, I got tickets to this dinner thing that I have to go to tonight. Are you game? She's like, pick me up in 30, you know, and we would roll. But you have, sometimes that's helpful and she would know because she knew how I operated so she would know I was coming straight for business so she, she would kind of like, you know, block the people who were trying to be like, oh, keep me, you know, way down in some conversation I don't want to be way down in. She would go chat them up, and she's not a big chatter, so this was like a stretch for her. Um, so she would chat them up so that I could make sure I came, got done what I came to do. All right? Um, so don't hide in a corner until it's time to go. That's why making a time frame is really great. When you, because it's so freeing. You're like, hey, I'm here for 30 minutes. So that means I better get this done because then I'm out. Now what happens is sometimes you end up being there for me way longer because you end up meeting someone, you end up getting in a, in a more in-depth conversation that actually ends up being productive. Okay? But you have that freedom to make those adjustments. Again, remember to go with a plan and go with a purpose. The law of reciprocity. Give and get, okay? It's really important, always. That's in relationships. I have relationships with folks that I may not have spoken with in two years. 
But because of the relationship we built up and because I stay connected to them, whether it's just sending them a note saying, hey, hello, just checking in on you, dropping a line, sending an article that I think, hey, I saw this, thought about you. When it comes two years later and I'm like, okay, you know, I really need this, guess what? I can pick up the phone and they will, they're like, hey, what do you need? Those are the types of relationships you're talking about building. You don't build those by just popping in and popping out, right? There's, you know, it's being, about being consistent. These are not things you have to create. You have them already. What you have to do is actually actively identify them and utilize them for what it is that you need right now. Um, yeah, I, the, lot, the greatest piece I like about this is you never know when a, when some, a huge favor will, you know, when it's going to hit a return, you know, and it's going to come back to you in a great way. <clears throat> Work on that plan of action. Who do you know? What organizations do you belong to? What organizations did you use to belong to? Um, <clears throat> what organizations do your friends belong to? What ones do you want to belong to but you don't currently? And which ones should you belong to because it makes good business sense? Do you see how, what, how much potential is in all of that? That's a wealth of information to be able to get through. So plan two, um, part two, pardon me, is the review and the who. So that's that piece where you'll go through and you'll see on there, we have business, professional organizations, community activities, your hobbies, your family and friends. There's a running joke in our circles because we have a couple of friends. We're like, I have no idea what she does. <laughs> I'm like, you know, one of my dearest, dearest friends, and I'm like, she does, she does healthcare consulting. That is as far as I can go. We have known each other for 25 years. But I'm like, I don't ask me any details. She does healthcare consulting, and she's damn good, you know, good at it. There we go, <laughs> right? Um, but that's really important in doing that and being able to acknowledge and have those conversations. So sometimes you can take that a little bit deeper, because when I've had some a little, you know, more in-depth conversations, I'm like, oh, she's worked for a couple of places where they were working on their own and they were doing, you know, uh, going through these RFP processes and all these different things that I'm like weren't relevant to me when I was working for someone, but now that I work for myself, guess what? I need to know a little bit more about how that works. Okay? <clears throat> Strategy number three, revise. You have to be willing to change things up, and you have to shift from just the who to the what. Right? You, gotta be, you have to be willing to make some changes. Um, I remember one time, so I'm big on coffee meetings. Um, they're not as committal, you know, committal as, uh, not as a, much of a commitment as uh, lunch or dinner. <laughs> um, and because if it's not going well, you can quickly end it. Um, but it's awesome, great for, you know, informational, getting to know people and things like that. I will never forget, there was one where I went a coffee meeting and uh, we were talking about some business, I think I was doing something on behalf of the chamber, quite frankly. And um, we talked the most about his family, and our, my family, and it turned out you know, we had these things in common about raising, you know, I have one girl and one boy, and he had two girls, and we were talking about this, they had moved from, you know, different places, so we were just spending all this time talking about these things that we, we discovered we had in common personally. We look up, we've been talking for an hour. We're like, oh crud, and I'm like, oh, I'm off task, you know? And so, but then we get to that point, and I'm like, well, I know, you know, we have to respect some time, but, you know, I would love to be able to get, you know, you involved in a couple of these things we're doing, and how we can do that. He says, oh, no worries. You just call my person and tell them what you want, and we'll take care of it. We never talked about, in depth, the nature of the business that we were. Do you see what just happened there? But because we have made that connection, on a different level, he's like, we're good. Just call him and tell him what you want, and we'll make it happen. That's the value of spending some time with people. I'm not saying you have to do all of that, but you never know. And you do know which ones you can maybe have to spend some time with. 
You know, you know those people are like, I've been meaning to call them forever. You know who those people are. By fostering and maintaining your diverse relationships, you raise others' awareness of your abilities. My favorite reason to be able to pull this out is I have a friend who we have kind of, uh, you know, he's one of the, uh, my, business, my professional colleagues that we um, used to work together on different projects. You know, he always worked for someone else, but we always end up collaborating in some kind of way. Well, because we kind of shifted, um, we maybe would, you know, meet six, once, a, uh, once or twice a year. So we hadn't had coffee in a minute, so we had coffee. So he starts talking, he's like, well, you know, are you still looking for a kid? Because this is going on, this is going on. And I'm like, how do I tell him I don't want to do that no more? Then I was like, okay, let me explain to you this way. We're talking about Patricia 2.0. <laughs> and he was like, oh, I said, that's not what I'm interested in doing anymore. And, we're, and he's like, oh, wait, wait. Okay, tell me about Patricia 2.0. And I'm like, I kind of like that, I'm going to use it. So I'm figuring I'm on the 4.0 version right now. <laughs> but that's the thing. If you don't keep people informed, they don't know. They're still working off of old information. You know, if what you've been doing is what you've been doing for 20 years and you're like, I'm done, then you need to make sure and tell people, I don't do that anymore. I don't want to do that anymore. I want to use the skills I learned from that, but here's what I want to do next. So when you revise and reconsider, who are you interacting with? Why are you being bothered with them? How are you doing it? Are you still going to certain meetings because, well, this is what they say I should do. Okay, but is it beneficial to you? Oh, but I still talk to this person because, you know, we were friends 15 years ago. Guess what? Sometimes they don't last. Sometimes it's time to move on, right? And it sounds kind of harsh, but it's the reality of things. If you're trying to move forward with a new job, with a new business, you know, with you know, entering whatever it is you're going to do, retirement, whatever it is, you have to recognize when, you know, the ebb and flow and be willing to release some things and people in order to make it happen. Um, yeah, the why are you being bothered? I, I ask that question a lot. Part three is talking about the reconsider and re-engage. Re so who, you know, it gets a little more blatant about it. What do you need to reconsider or eliminate? What or who? Because sometimes that's really the deal. You need, there are some things you need to take off the plate. I have a, a, a sheet that I bring with me, but I call it the elimination diet. <laughs> <laughs> Last strategy, you have to be willing to reach out. None of, this, none of this means anything if you don't reach out and touch people. Actually, you know, Go out, try something new, reach out to someone you don't know, okay? And it may sound like, well, that's the usual, but when you're talking about in the content of everything that we've been talking about today, that's different, right? It's, a, it's talking about reaching out to that organization that you have no connection with now, but you think it might be beneficial to you. Um, <clears throat> Go engage and follow up. Um, you know, the action on any of these things is always the key, but that last one, oh my gosh. Uh, people do not follow up. I think there's been actual research um, done that like 95% of people do not follow up. You can be in the top 5% of people just by following up. So when you've gone to coffee, when you've had a lunch, when you've gone to a conference, right, and you've met someone interesting, and you're like, oh, that was great, but you do nothing about it, it's all in the follow-up. And it's so valuable, and you'll be ahead of the game because most people do not do it. Uh, <clears throat> it's how you strengthen and maintain your relationships. You have to call before you need something. <laughs> You know, um, so that's that, you know, offering something, hey, I saw this. Hey, just wanted to check in, see how you're doing. How was that vacation you were talking about you were going on? It doesn't have to be anything big and fancy, but it's about making a real connection and engaging on those things in an authentic way so that when you do need something, you can do it and not feel all slimy like we were talking about earlier.
to your, to your contacts. Now, people are like, what do you mean by that? Well, I don't reach out to everybody I know every day or every month, right? So there are people, like I said, who I may not have talked to in three or four years, and so they're on my thing of I reach out to them once a year. There are other people, especially folks that I'm trying to get to know them better, that I reach out to, let's say, once a month or something like that. So tier your contacts. You, when you make your list of people you want to reach out to, things you want to do, literally put it on a calendar. You know, saying, I'm going to reach out to this person, you know, once a month. I'm going to go do this thing once a month. Or I'm going to do this once a quarter. Okay? Because what happens when you don't write it down, you forget. And you look up and you're like, oh. I mean, I have this thing that I was very religious about. Um, particularly when I started out in my um, business where I literally pointed, I would write down who I met new every single day. And my goal was to have... 10 to 20 contacts per week. Super aggressive. And then I would follow up on them with a handwritten note. No one does that anymore, which is why I did. And those things are, I will never forget one time I did that with a, someone here in town who was new to a high profile position. We had been trying to catch up and I hadn't been able to. So I, I just wrote a note saying, hey, congrats on making it through your first you know, year of doing this, still hope we can catch up sometime, whatever. She responded to me saying, thank you for your thank you note, for your well note. I'm like, who does that, right? But then she made a point of making sure I got on her calendar. Okay, that's the value of interpersonal contacts and relationships. <clears throat> when you make the ask, because this is part of reaching out and people forget, is you do have to ask sometimes. So know what you're asking for whether it's advice and counsel, whether it's the sale, um, additional connections, um, or access to additional resources. You know, you can't do that. People, y'all know these people who do this, like we've just met, they're like, oh, I would really, it would be great if you would do X for me. I don't know you. <laughs> and they're lucky sometimes, I, I don't have a good poker face, so my face might say that. <laughs> My face might say that, I shouldn't. My face might say that though. Um, <clears throat> and, but this happens. I had this happen with someone who I used to be so, I won't say close, but we had a good, I thought was a decent relationship. I moved on, she kind of slept away, and, didn't, and then out of the blue just shows back up, literally, I swear to God, asking me to send out information for her to my network. Honey, I am not doing that. I, I protect my network with a passion. You are not getting access to my network like that. But she did, I'm telling you, that was a, that's a real situation. I can say names and times, right? So you don't want to do that. Don't be that person. So the last part four is reaching out and connecting. Make sure <clears throat> that you uh, look at the people, places, and issues that you might want to connect on. And that's on that, that, that last part of that sheet. The most valuable tools when building and growing a business and your greatest assets are the relationships you've built over the years. Whether it's a business, whether it's a profession, um, new career, new opportunities, the relationships that you build are what's the most valuable. You can't, no, you, people can't take those away from you. All right, and lastly, I believe, whether we really realize it or not, networking is part and parcel of everyone's lives. Our, connect, our concentric circles of relationships from, biz, from the business, ball field, church, and social, and, and school impact our lives. What we choose to do with them is up to us. So, your tool success or your willingness to, reserve, to serve, your virtual, I'm going to have to add, edit this, I should say virtual Rolodex, that's the Rolodex, right? But, but I consider LinkedIn a virtual Rolodex, which is why I'm so protective of it. Um, <clears throat> note cards, because those are great you know, to stick in your pocket, in a purse, be able to say, here are the three people I'm going to meet this week, and just honesty and authenticity. I was talking to a, a young man uh, earlier this week, and he's going to get into um, the lobby mm -hmm. community. Can you give um, directions as to who I can talk to? 
Not that far. Right, right. Would you offer that sort of opportunity? Yes. Yes, I mean because it's really about you know what the what's the subject matter yeah. because it generally depends on like if they have a specific subject matter and whatever type of. He's, he's just exploring. He's yeah, yeah. And young and uh, just trying to get into. Uh, Absolutely. Not, not looking for a specific job. Okay. Questions. You said you didn't like business cards. I didn't think that was the way. Yes. So. <clears throat> Here's my thing about business cards because this is the other thing people think you're like you walk up and they're like oh you know hey here's my business card and you're just talking and then you go and they're like going off right okay but there's no connection you don't have anything so here's one of my tricks with business cards number one in general and this is going to sound bad I don't carry a whole lot of business cards on me because if I'm giving you my business card I'm really wanting to make sure that I connect with you later for some other purpose okay. And we have so much technology, I will often tell people to link to, um, um, to connect to me on LinkedIn. Okay, so you're still connecting without giving a business card. Now, if you're exchanging business cards, then make sure it's for a reason, right? You know, because they're not free, they're not cheap. And what's going to happen with those business cards? Y'all know about that pile of business cards that ends up on a desk somewhere. I'm not the only one, okay? So, <clears throat> So make it worth your while. The other thing I do though, if I've exchanged a business card with someone, what I do is I immediately, either right after that event, like in the car or once I get home, I write on the back where I met them and what stood out. So now I don't have some random business card that I pick up and I'm like, where did I meet this person? What I want? And I have no idea. Now I remember, oh, I met them at that chamber event, and they have some knowledge about X. So when I follow up with them, I now have something specific to reference back to them about. And that's why you don't just randomly head out, because you only get that information if you spent some time talking to them. Yes, sir. I have two questions. Yeah. Uh, first. Tell me a little bit about PDH Consulting, mm -hmm. and then you showed a, a, uh, a chart earlier that had sunshine and thunderbolts. At what point in there did you become PDH Consulting? Um, I became PDH Consulting at the end. <laughs> that last thunderbolt is what sent me over the edge. Uh, <laughs> that was about 10 years ago. Uh, and I'm pretty open about it because I think that that's one of the things about being authentic and people aren't open and honest about their situations, but guess what? That's what people learn the most from. So I had a very high level um, um, C-suite position for a university system and things changed. My boss, you know, retired and oh my God, I had been too loyal to my boss, so therefore politics. Had nothing to do with my job. I mean, it was straight politics. And I mean, and my job was political. So, okay, fine. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, I really had no idea of what I was going to do next, you know, but I do know, and this is one of those things where you talk about career transitions and what's your value, because my children were very little at that time, and it wasn't even the job, but the situation that I was in had stressed me out so badly that I was in physical pain for 18 months up to that point. True story. The day after I got laid off, I felt no pain. None. It disappeared completely. One of the most mind-boggling things I have ever experienced. I still get chills about it. Okay? So that's when I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do next, but I'm not going to do anything that's going to create that because my kids were like, I don't know, six and two at the time, if that. And I'm like, I need to be able to be alive for them later. So none of that's worth it. So I went exploring, um, um, and I, what I was trying to do was just pick up a couple of contracts while I figured out what I was going to do next. And what came to me, that little mastermind group that I told you I referenced, that I pulled back, well, at least two of the five people that I spoke with had told me I should be going out and doing some consulting on my own. And I was like, are you crazy? I'm going to do that in 10 years. I mean, because it really was not on my radar. And I had one of them 
who was very, and I, my group was very diverse, and it was deliberate, right? Female, male, black, white, whatever, because I was interested in getting a deception because I had been so buried in this nonsense, I couldn't see things clearly. And so when I see them, and they're like, what are you talking about? You know what your value is? And literally one of those gentlemen who was like, I don't know why we're even having this conversation. He was like, you're, you know, with your background, your skill set, there's no reason why you can't go out and do this, right? And so <clears throat> that's when I first, and so literally it was after that, so I had reached out to another one of my contacts, thinking, okay, I was trying to you know, go pick up some, um, um, their legislative work. So I was actually trying to you know, get him to connect me with their GR person, their internal GR person. He was like, yeah, I'm not gonna do that. I was like, well, crap. He was like, that's because I need you for something. He says, I have this group of people. I have the lawyers on one hand and my program people on the other, and they do not speak the same language. He goes, but we need these, um, they were, so they were giving away millions of dollars in, um, in funding every year. And there were some agreements that needed to go to the folks, um, the programs that were getting the money. Well, the problem was the program staff did not write this, the agreement strong enough. They made the, the lawyers queasy. And the lawyers wrote them so strict that the program, program people were like, oh my God, you're gonna, they're gonna go away. So he was like, I need you to come in and be the translator. Because you understand the lawyers, but you also understand our programs from the policy perspective. And that was my first consulting gig. Because someone recognized my skill set and the value I could bring to them. I wasn't even trying to do that. I was trying to get him to talk to the GR guy. I had that uh, responsibility for them for three or four years. Every summer, came, I, would, I would write 35 to 50 uh, uh, program agreements for them uh, through their process, got pulled in to do some other things for them. When it got through, there was one that was being created as a new, the lawyer privately, who was like <sighs> before, came to me privately and said, oh my God, thank you so much, because I didn't know what they wanted and there was no way I could have crafted that for them. So that's how PPS Consulting started in June of that year, um, and, um, and I've been just going ever since and being very fluid. So I probably need to update that chart because even within that, that's been nine years, I shift it. I don't do as much legislative work anymore. I still do some policy. I'm doing much more executive advising and coaching and strategic planning because those are other shifts that I've always done in my work, but I didn't get to do them solely. I get to choose, so I can do that now. Did that answer all your questions? Yes, ma'am. So some of your clients are companies and some of your clients are individuals. Yes. yes. And then in your little chart, you had up the stair step, you had your arrows all going in, in one direction, and then up the top where it was kind of wavy, mm -hmm. you frequently had arrows going from both directions. Of each other, does that mean anything? Is that significant at all? Uh, I think it was just probably because that was when I was uncertain, right? That's, that's that period where I'm like, I'm not sure where I'm headed because that's where I was at that point. I was like, I have no idea. Now, I know I'm still ultimately going forward, but I'm not sure what I'm going to do. But it's also indicating ultimately I use all of the knowledge and skills that I had previously and all those relationships that came along with it. And I utilize those. And still to this day, other questions? Yes, sir. So you have this awesome team of guys, I guess. I mean, you know, like you have a big system, I guess. I no, I do not have a big system. Um, I, so quite frankly, I'm, I'm only half joking. My system was literally because I'm very tactile, and so literally, I have tons of journals where I kept, and so literally, I would keep. Um, there, was a, there was one that I was using, but then it didn't do as much as I wanted it to do. So, I, quite frankly, I'm in the midst of like shifting and creating one for my creating one that's more um, uh, personalized. But it worked pretty good because what it allowed me to do was to write down, like, like I said, when I set those goals of, you know, if I'm going to go to five, you know, three to five coffees or lunches per week, um, and then reaching out and touching at least ten people per week. 
whether that was through LinkedIn, whether that was in person, you know, a handwritten note. And so I literally, I mean, I have journals full of me doing these because I was transitioning and the last thing I wanted to do moving out onto my own was to lose contact with the world around me. So I was very diligent. So now I don't do that as stringently because I because I've been doing it for so long. But I, you know, it's a good question because I've caught myself a few times. I would know when something was not quick, not quite right because I'm like, it's awfully quiet. Well, that's when I go back. And I'm like, oh, you haven't been doing your touch out because the more you reach out, there's always a flow of people coming back in, right? So I still know to this day when I'm not when it gets quiet. It means I have been doing enough outreach of my own and it's time to get back on it. That's that giving part.